On today's show, your mailbag questions, some latest news on the Hawks, the Olympics, and much more, and all of that is on the way. You are Locked On Hawks, your daily Atlanta Hawks podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello, friends. Welcome to episode 1780 of the Lothan Hawks podcast. I am your host, Brad Roland, coming to you on a Wednesday evening into Thursday here in early to mid-August. And today's podcast is sponsored by the folks at FanDuel Sportsbook. FanDuel is America's number one sportsbook, and this summer they're giving us all, yes, all customers, a boost or a bonus every single day all summer long. Visit FanDuel.com and add a big win to your summer bucket list. I also would encourage you at the top of the podcast to make us your first listen here at Lothan Hawks each and every day. Check us out on Apple Podcasts, on Spotify, on Overcast, etc. on the audio side. We're also on YouTube. Please like this episode as you are watching it, and please subscribe to uh, the podcast on the YouTube platform. It's been busy, as always, on this podcast. I did a really fun two-part episode with a new guest, David Lee, earlier this week. The response has been very encouraging to that podcast. They will be back, I'm sure, in the near future. That one is certainly worth listening to at this point in time, talking about all the young guys for the Hawks in particular. This might be the last show of this week because we're paring down a little bit in August, but at minimum, I'll have at least three shows each and every week all the way until training camp. And even once we get closer to that, up to four or five again, as we always do. But today will be a mailbag edition of the podcast. I'm out of pocket a little bit over the next couple of days, but I want to make sure you had some podcast content going into the weekend. Also, next week, I'm planning to have the V. Krejci player capsule breakdown with my guy, Glenn Willis, to continue that series of things. And uh, we already have much more of that coming up in the future. And uh, stay tuned for all of that. But anyway, before we get to the mailbag, a little bit of news and also um, the uh, sort of Olympic check-in at this point. So Today, actually, as I'm recording this podcast on Wednesday into Thursday, the Hawks announced their preseason schedule. I had already started to hear a little bit of rumblings about this, but the Hawks will actually be opening their preseason schedule exactly two months to the day as I'm posting this podcast on Thursday. So their first game in the preseason is going to be uh, October 8th at home against Indiana. The Hawks will only play four games in the exhibition schedule this year, two home Two road, that first one at home against Indiana, and then they'll go on the road to Miami on Thursday, October the 10th, then back at home on Monday, October 14th against the Sixers, and then the final game will be on the road Thursday, October 17th against Oklahoma City. Um, the last couple of years, the Hawks have had some kind of special games, whether it was going overseas what, or you know going to Birmingham, playing at College Park, etc. This time around, it's pretty straight ahead. All four games are in the normal arenas, two home, two road. It's a big TBD on the TV side of things still as the as of today, but three of the four games will be on the local radio, 92 on the game in Atlanta. So we'll see how the uh, TV side looks as we get closer, but this is the first kind of schedule firmness, we'll say. Um, if the NBA follows its recent record and history, the real schedule, the 82-game regular season schedule should be out in the next couple of weeks sometime, next two or three weeks sometime in August is when it has, has been coming out. In recent days, so stay tuned for that. And of course, when that happens, I'll have a full breakdown as to the strengths and the national TV games and all those fun things. We'll circle that in a couple of weeks. Um, beyond that, the Olympics is still ongoing. As I talked about with David on that show a couple of days ago, the headliner of the entire Hawks Olympic run basically was this game on Tuesday morning between Australia and Serbia. Dyson Daniels against Bogdan Bogdanovic, the two guys for the Hawks playing in the Olympics. And it was basically the single most relevant game the entire way. Australia blew a massive lead, actually, ended up losing in overtime, which ends the summer run for Dyson Daniels as far as competition is concerned on the floor. Only played about 20 minutes or so. It was kind of controversial, we'll say. He missed only two shots that he took, had three steals. Um, I'm not going to sort of dissect the Australian national team, but it was at least kind of uh, notable the way he didn't play at the end of the game. Uh, I, I, I would say charitably pass up on some shots offensively, but, you know, there you go. I'm still very excited about Destin Daniels. We talked about a lot on that re recent show with David, but uh, he is now done as far as games are concerned. As for Bogey, he actually played more in the game on Tuesday than he has been playing because the game went to overtime. So he zoomed beyond 30 minutes. Didn't shoot all that well in that game, but he had been really, really hot before that. And Bogey is Bogey. The whole thing right now with Bogey and Hawks fans is just kind of holding your breath that he gets through the tournament healthy and feeling good. Serbia has done a nice job, I think, overall, limiting the minutes for Bogey and Nikola Jokic, their two big guns, of course. Um, but actually going to play the U.S. on Thursday um, in the semifinals. That's a 9 o'clock local game in Paris. That's a 3 o'clock p.m. Eastern time game on Thursday. 
FanDuel right now, our friends there have the U.S. as a pretty big favorite, so a decent chance that the last game of the summer will be happening for Bogey as well on Thursday, but TBD on that. And uh, if you want to see Bogey play at least one more time, 3 o'clock p.m. Eastern time against the U.S. on Thursday. All right, from there, mailbag question time. The rest of the podcast will be your questions to me. And if, as always, I want to tell you, you can send in questions. I'm always taking them. It's not like I'm going to put a specific call, but I'm always monitoring. Uh, first of all, there's an email address. It's LockedOnHawks at gmail.com. Also send it to me on Twitter at BT Roland or at LockedOnHawks is the show account. And also if you follow my work at Patreon.com slash BT Roland, I will take questions on that service as well. First question on today's podcast comes from Porter, who says, is there anywhere the Hawks could send DeAndre Hunter at this point in the offseason, or is that a lost cause? I saw a thread about the Jazz being a team that could take Hunter in. Uh, I won't do a long answer here. We covered it a little bit in recent days, but because Porter mentioned the Jazz, it's kind of it's timely right now. Lori Markinen is now off the market for Utah. In fact, is already signed a big deal, actually, as of today. That includes a renegotiation. That is relevant for the Hawks because it's the only team in the league until today, basically, that had, I would say, meaningful cap space, uh, more than 10, 11 million in cap space. And now that is now gone. Utah used that to sign marketing. So I don't know what Porter saw about Utah and whatever threat he found, but I would guess it probably has something to do with that. And the Jazz could have taken Hunter or even Capella, one of those guys, into their space without having to match any salary. But that, that now cannot happen, which is kind of notable. For the record, I never heard anything about Hunter and the Jazz, but that was he mentioned it, and they were the one team that actually had big time cap space. As for the rest of the question, I would say this: it is not guaranteed that the Hawks will keep Hunter through the season or until training camp opens, etc. But certainly, it is overwhelmingly the most likely scenario at this point. I've said this a lot in different kind of variations about the whole roster, but especially for guys who like have to have, you know have big money committed, like Hunter, for by the way, three more years. Andre Andre Hunter, um, the vast majority of the NBA's business is now done. Now, moves will happen. Some sort of moves, you know, extensions will happen. Margins on, you know, signs on the margins, maybe a trade out of nowhere. But most of the time, you get into like mid-August, the least kind of on vacation for a month, basically. So we'll see how that how that goes. Maybe a team could emerge, emerge out of nowhere that wants him, or the Hawks could decide that they're kind of more urgent suddenly in trying to trade him and maybe willing to attach something to trade him but as far as I know, to this point, and I've been poking around this for months now, the Hawks have not been willing to attach an asset to trade DeAndre Hunter. And if you don't know what that means, that means basically um, they don't want to include one of their picks just in order to get Hunter's contract off of their books. Um, and unless they do that, I don't have a team in mind that is viewing him as a positive, notably on that contract. That kind of leads you to some questionable areas because while the, the cap is going up, we saw this across the league this summer. Um, it's kind of a divide. Like the top guys got paid a lot of money and the middle class got squeezed a little bit. And that is kind of where Hunter firmly stands as a middle class player as far as where his contract actually is sitting. But again, I'm not telling you there's 100% chance he's on the team because that's not true. But I'm planning on him being on the team. I think you'll see him probably at both forward spots this year, small forward and power forward at different times. Obviously, he'll be backing up Jalen Johnson at the four. I'm not saying he's going to start there. But I think Hunter is at, at the moment on the team, three years left. And just to say it one more time, like I don't think the league is clamoring to trade for DeAndre Hunter's contract, and that is probably the main reason he is still on the Hawks. I think the Hawks, if they could just trade DeAndre Hunter easily without any pain, they probably would do that, is kind of what I've heard. Um, probably, not definitely, but probably. But gone are the days where they can like hold out hope of getting like a huge asset back for him. Maybe if he has a great season. And just for the record, I did a podcast about DeAndre Hunter with Glenn Willis over the summer. I think Hunter actually had his best overall season this last year for the Hawks. But still, the money and the deal is seen as kind of not an albatross, but a little bit too much for him. And uh, here in August, a deal like that probably is going to get moved. So there you go. Hopefully that answers the question from Porter. All right, we'll have more of your mailbag questions coming up in a moment, including stuff on, let's just say, Reed Shepard and Zach Richache. Later on in the show, Quinn Snyder versus David McMillan, perhaps. That'll be interesting. And then uh, also some stuff about where the recent Hawks draft picks might have gone if they were in the 2024 draft at the end of the show. But first, it worth from our partners on today's podcast. Today's show is brought to you by BetterHelp. And when you're thinking about your absolute non-negotiables for self-care, what do you think about? Maybe you actually never miss yours. That'd be awesome, of course. But when your schedule is packed with projects or travel, it can be hard sometimes to make time for yourself. When you feel like you have no time for yourself, those non-negotiable things like therapy become more important than ever. 
Therapy was helpful for everyone, honestly, and can help you focus on what you are looking for, what you want, instead of what others might happen to have. Then that starts to help you live your best possible life. You can learn positive coping skills, how to set better boundaries. I have my own stresses in my life, of course, and we also benefit from getting things off our chest sometimes. And the folks at BetterHelp are uh, really helpful with that. If you're thinking about starting therapy at all, give BetterHelp a try right now. It's entirely online. It's designed to be convenient and it's flexible to your schedule. And that's really huge if you are someone like me now being a lot of, sort of time crunches like I often happen to be. BetterHelp is awesome with that. And all you have to do is fill out a brief questionnaire to get matched with a licensed therapist. You can also switch therapists anytime if you want to for no additional charge. Never skip therapy day with the folks at BetterHelp. And you can visit BetterHelp.com slash LockedOnNBA to get 10% off your first month with BetterHelp. One more time, the place to go is BetterHelp. That's better H E L P. BetterHelp.com slash LockedOnNBA. All right, a question from Frankie who says, I really like Reed Shepard, but I'm emailing to make sure that I'm not crazed. Not crazy, but crazed. Um, the Hawks could not pick him, right? I feel like this is a pretty clear thing, but I also keep hearing podcasts pick on Landry Fields for not taking him number one and not the Hawks for taking Zach with two Cs, of course, Zach Arisha. Um, Broadly speaking, I think two things can be true at the same time here. First, I think Reed Shepard looked really good in Las Vegas. And if uh, judging by only that, which is never the case, by the way, um, I think people that are smart that I would say um, had him at the top of their board. So like, it's reasonable to have him number one on your board right now from this last draft. That's all very reasonable. Second, I don't believe the Hawks could realistically take Reed Shepard unless they thought he was far and away the best player in the draft. And I don't think personally that gap was present with Shepard versus the field or versus Reed Shea. Now, why do I say that? For one, the Hawks did consider taking Reed Shepard. That was reported on draft day by Woj and others. I heard the same thing, said that a lot around the draft. He was basically, from what I heard, the runner-up at the end of the process behind Reese Shea for where they were. Obviously, I talked about this a little, a little bit with David earlier in this week, but I'm not really convinced that the Hawks would have taken Alex Sar even without the drama. And by the end, he was kind of off their board. Um, and I do think the Hawks front office did like Reed Shepard and does like Reed Shepard. And he does generally check the box that they like with prospects. Obviously, the shooting, the ball handling, the, the general savvy, his hands defensively, all those things. And to Frankie's point, I've heard the same stuff that he has from national podcasts and outlets after Summer League that the Hawks should have taken him. I kind of understand that on some level, given the way I said about what he earlier about how he looked. He played, he played really well in Summer League. But one, this is a, me saying the same thing I always say about Summer League, but people react to Summer League, and I would say overreact to Summer League in all directions, positively and negatively, keep that in mind. But the biggest thing that I think is like willfully ignorant to talk about, or not talk about, I should say, is the fact that Reed Shepard is a point guard size player. And taking him number one overall without strongly considering the actual context that the pick was made in is just a mistake. Like, it's not a vacuum. The Hawks weren't a blank canvas roster. I cover this a lot in the, in the pre-draft lead-up. This is not a traditional number one overall pick team that had like a blank slate. They have two guys, Trey Young and Jalen Johnson, who are firmly entrenched. And by the way, this is important. It's an important thing to consider. At the time of the draft, the Hawks still had DeJounte Murray as well. So they entered the draft and exited the draft with Trey Young and DeJounte Murray on their roster with multiple teams, so multiple years, I should say, of team control for both guys. And look, I did argue for months that the Hawks needed to, to kind of separate those guys. I think the Murray Trey was a pretty good one for the Hawks, as I said on this podcast. But when the pick was made, they had Trey and they had Ajante. And there's no thing that I have heard to indicate that that deal was just like done. I think there were a few days in between. That's when the deal happened, et cetera. They were obviously talking to teams before that. I'm not going to say they weren't, but it wasn't like they could 100% plan on not having Trey and Ajante on their team when they made the draft pick. So <laughs> that's just notable. Now, this is not a Rockets podcast. So I'm not going to like dive in deep on Shepard, but. He does have like good secondary defensive skills, great hands, for instance. But he did measure in at point guard size. He's like six one and a half without shoes, six three and a half or so wingspan. Like he's a point guard size player, and he is not like a nuclearly great athlete. He's a solid athlete for sure, but he gets attacked one on one. Uh, probably will his whole career. I think he'll be a solid enough defender, but not a guy who's gonna be like a great like on ball guy, for instance. And we all know about Trey, like while Trey is improved, while I like Trey a lot, Trey's very good. And I think underrated at this point in time, Trey's defensive weaknesses are well documented and they still exist, even if he has gotten better on the end of the floor. So I get it. There's kind of a school of thought that the Hawks could have just like pivoted a little bit into a deeper rebuild this summer. But of course, that does ignore that the Hawks don't have control of their own draft picks for the next three seasons. 
and the actual logistics of trying to trade Trey and DeJounte in the same summer and go into a full rebuild, it wasn't impossible, but it would have been very difficult. So beyond that, the market for Trey was not really there, it seemed like. So even if the Hawks wanted to trade Trey Young, from what I heard, they didn't have the like godfather offer waiting for them to do that. So all that thrown in, I don't think Trey and Reed would have worked together long term viably on defense. Offensively, it would have been a lot of fun, I think. But defensively, it is what it is. And personally, without going again crazy, I don't have Reed in his own tier or anything like that. Like I, I think he and Risha Shea are similar tier prospects. Like they're not a big difference there. And again, what I said before it still stands. If the Hawks had viewed Reed Shepard as the clear, clear number one guy, then yeah, take the best guy. I, I did say that at the time of the draft about Saar and other like that by the way, that still applies to Saar. Even with Saar not wanting to come to Atlanta, if the Hawks felt like he was the guy in capital letters, I said this before the draft, you just take him anyway. Same thing applies to Reed Shepard. But they obviously did not feel that way, or they would have taken him. I think Ledger Fields would have had to go into the draft thinking Reed was like such clearly the guy, but they didn't evaluate that way, nor did I. But there's definitely a chance that we look up in five years that Reed Shepard is the best player in the class. That's definitely possible. Like, very possible. But if that happens, I can promise you if I'm still doing this podcast, I'll be the one giving the actual context around that if that scenario plays out. Because I'm sure it'll be revisionist history. Oh, my God, the Hawks were number one overall. They didn't take Reed Shepard. It's hard for me to believe that a team that had Trey Young on the roster, and by the way, Trey Young and Ajante Murray on the roster, was going to turn around and draft a point guard size player at number one overall. And yeah, you can accuse me of being too high on Trey, whatever it is. Like I went from being too famously, everybody thought I was too low on Trey for years. Now it's apparently the other way. But no matter what, Trey is the best player on the team still. And you're drafting a guy who's very similar to him physically. And then, by the way, there's, you know, I got a separate question I won't answer now about the Wizards. Look, if I was the Wizards, it, there's more risk there because the Wizards have no reason not to take Reed Shepard. If they thought that he was the best player, there's no one that was standing in his way in the way that Atlanta is. And number one overall, as I've said many times, you take the best player, but there are different limitations of that. And I think with the Hawks, the limitations there were uh, one, Jalen Johnson. If, you, if, if there was a guy who's a straight four they didn't think fit, fit with Jalen, that was something to at least consider. And the other one was point guard. And Reed Shepard is, for me, a point guard size player. And there you go. So hopefully, hopefully that answers the question as far as like the actual question itself. The Hawks, I wouldn't say the Hawks couldn't pick him. That was the question that Frankie asked. I wouldn't say that, but context is very important. That's how I'll leave it on that answer. And I think that it was perfectly reasonable for the Hawks to pass on Reed Shepard. I, I feel that way now. I'll still feel that way in five years. There's a chance Risa Shea is not as good as Reed Shepard. That's definitely the case. Same thing. The draft's not an exact science, but I will leave it there for now. All right, I have at least two more questions coming up on this podcast. But first, it worked for my partners on the show today. Today's show is brought to you by FanDuel Sportsbook. It's summertime, means baseball, basketball, and so much more. You can bet it all at FanDuel Sportsbook. FanDuel is America's number one sportsbook in this summer. They're hooking us all up. Yes, all customers with a boost or a bonus every single day. Something for everyone every day, all summer long. You can bet all of your favorite players, your favorite teams with quick bets, live same game parlays, exclusive props, and much more. The app at FanDuel Sportsbook is really easy to use as well. They have everything you're looking for in the sports betting space. Over-unders, point spreads, money lines, player props, live betting, future bets, and so much more. The app is safe. It's secure. They cover the entire range of sports as well. That includes the NBA, of course, WNBA, NFL, college football is coming up pretty soon, MLB, golf, tennis, soccer, auto racing, boxing, MMA, and so many more sports. And now is a great time to sign up with the folks at FanDuel Sportsbook. And all you have to do is visit FanDuel.com to get started. One more time, just visit. FanDuel.com and start making the most out of your summer with FanDuel, official sports betting partner of Major League Baseball. Okay, a question from Christian with a K. Where are you at with this whole Quinn versus Nate argument that is all over Hawks Twitter? So this is a, this is a few days ago now, admittedly, as I got this question, but I flagged it to come back to. I don't really know where it came from, but I saw my guy Glenn Willis reference this on Twitter. I poked around a little bit that there was this conversation happening about Quinn and Nate in like late July, early August. I don't know why it happened, but it doesn't really matter. Uh, for the record, I don't know all of what was said or argued about Hawks fans. So I'm not trying to like answer all these questions, but as far as where am I at with it, I presume the gist of it is that the Hawks would have been just better off keeping Nate. There's people that think that. 
you know, it is what it is there. Uh, and or they're not satisfied with Quinn, which is probably more about what it is. I think the other guy who's not the guy you don't like looks better. That's always the case. Um, it was the same thing with, uh, you know, with Nate, people looking back at Lloyd. It doesn't matter. Coaches are always uh, – coach discussions are difficult in a lot of ways because um, in every sport – I do the same thing with manager. I cover baseball too. Manager gets if your team struggles, manager gets the heat. NFL coaches, same thing. College coaches, same thing. It is what it is. But instead of the hour long version of this, I'll go a little bit shorter, keep it tidy. And yes, I think a lot of this came from the fact that the Hawks had a had a better win loss record under Nate than they do right now under Quinn. And if that's as far as you want to go, I can't argue with you because Nate has a better record. And yes, they made the conference finals round with with Nate. But that is the kind of like top on, top down only analysis that I don't really subscribe to with anything, especially not like this. Um, the best stretch, of course, with Nate at the helm was Nate taking over for Lloyd Pierce midseason with all of Lloyd's assistance and the offense that was installed under Lloyd. That's when the Hawks were at their best. Now, it obviously helped that they had Bogey and Clint playing at their absolute peak levels. People should not forget that. But. I think the combination of Pierce's tactics and installation with Nate's veteranness, steady hand, old school style, that worked. It, it was lighting in the bottle for three, four months. That worked very well. Then Nate, Nate gets a full-time job, which honestly, I had no argument with that, even still now. Like as, if the guy takes you to a conference finals and he has the record that Nate had previously, giving him the job is not a problem. That was a normal thing for the Hawks to do. I criticized them for different things. That was a very normal thing. With that said, as soon as he brought in his own staff, he reverted to his worst tendencies, I think, with like a pretty stagnant offense. It's kind of outdated, old school. The results leveled off considerably as a result of that. He was never the right coach for me to maximize Trey and DeJounte together once that deal happened because you kind of need some innovation, and that's not really Nate's thing. He's a steady hand, not really an innovator. Um, but anyway, I'll stop now. I'll just say my overarching thought is that I do think that Quinn Snyder is a better coach than McMillan. Do I think the gap is like absolutely massive or like it's the Grand Canyon? No. Like Quinn's not Eric Spolstra, who's the best coach in the league, in my opinion. Nate is not the worst coach in the league. Like the gap is not that big because generally speaking, outside of the absolute elite guys and the couple of guys in the league that I don't think are very good, everybody from like five to 25 is fairly close together. I think these guys are all pros. They're not idiots. Like I understand people, I might disagree. Like, look, I'll share my opinion on this podcast when, when games happen. Like, there's stuff that Quinn did this year that I didn't like, and that's okay. He's smarter than I am about basketball. That's just the reality of the situation. But um, people got mad at me near the end with Lloyd. Uh, same with Nate, because there was always this notion that either guy was just like flat out awful. And how do you defend this? And I didn't ever get to the point where I thought those guys were like just so actively terrible. But I do think that Nate is like an average head coach or even maybe below average head coach in the NBA. Uh, he had a very good career, of course. He's been coaching for a long time. I respect him quite a bit for what he's done. As a player, as a coach, all that stuff, he's won a ton of games. I think he's just kind of fine. And I don't put Quinn in that top, 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 top tier either, but I do think he's better than Nate in a vacuum. I'd rather have Nate. Sorry, I'd rather have Quinn than Nate in a vacuum. It's not my money, and it's not on the salary cap. So the one thing on, on an NBA team that doesn't have any impact to any fan about like how much it costs is the head coach because it's not on the cap. So if you can pay a bazillion dollars, it doesn't matter. Uh, Quinn's making a lot of money. He deserves it after the, way, after, the way, after the way Utah went. I will say this. I don't think he's had the greatest results in Atlanta. Like, I don't, I don't put a ton of that on him, but some of it has to be on him. Like, that's that's the reality. The Hawks have had some very well-chronicled roster issues. His only full season in Atlanta was this last year. And it's important to remember that, like, it was the first time Trey Young's ever been hurt. That obviously is a big deal when your best player gets down goes down for 30 games. And the Hawks also somehow entered, entered the season last year with three NBA-level forwards on the whole roster. Like, they had a real... Roster issues, plus injury issues last year. Could, Nate, could Quinn have done some stuff, di some stuff differently? Absolutely. Does he deserve some, I want to say heat, like does he deserve some criticism for the way that things went? Sure he does. Like that's part, he's part of the overall fabric. But to just line it up and say Nate's record was this, Quinn's record was this, Nate's better. That's a very silly way to approach it, I think. Like I could do it this way, but like most of the time, Eric Spolstra, who I think people in the league would almost certainly vote as the top coach, if, or if not, certainly not out of the top three, let's say. If you don't think he's the best, look at his team records. They're not always the best. The Heat are not going to be the number one team in the league just because just because Spolstra was there. It's a player's league. You have to you have to have talent. Like just because one coach wins more games than Spolstra one year doesn't mean he's better. It's there's more nuance to that. I think Quinn's better. 
we'll see how this goes moving forward. All things equal, I would lean that direction. And by the way, all things are never equal. I know I use that phrase, but with coaches, like the rosters are different, roster different, all those things, rosters change, context changes. You have to look beyond the records. I don't think Nate was awful. I don't think Nate was particularly good either. I don't think Quinn's a bum because they didn't win a lot of games last year either. We'll see. But I, I would personally prefer Quinn. Uh, I think Quinn has, has a better record in the last 10 years. Or so. When I say record, I don't mean win-loss record, like body of work the last 10 years with what he did in Utah. And uh, I might be wrong, and we'll see. All right. Uh, probably the last question on today's podcast comes from Josh, who says, where were the Hawks' recent first-round selections? And he names them, Kobe, AJ, Jalen, and Onyeka have been taken if they were in the 2024 draft class. So quickly before I answer this, there's one more guy that I didn't include here, but um, I showed this before on a podcast recently, but my friend Sam Epstein of The Athletic uh, recently wrote that he actually had a top 30 grade on Don Barlow. And Don Barlow is a guy I talked about with David Lee earlier this week, but obviously I, I would agree with that. I think that Barlow would have been a late first round pick for me, probably right now in this last draft. I say all that though, I just want to at least mention that as a sort of a plug for last for the last show I did. But I could do a long answer on this. I'm not going to do that. that. I'm not going to do that. But there are two ways to answer this question. I think the spirit of the question from Josh was where they would have been taken as prospects, like without the benefit of hindsight, basically. This is especially relevant to Jalen, of course, because I'll just say this: if you knew what you know now about Jalen Johnson, if you if you knew you had those that body of work. He might go number one overall. He certainly wouldn't go very far below number one overall in this last class. Because this last class, as if you didn't hear, that, hear my draft coverage, not the best draft class in the world. I think it was kind of pretty normal draft after the top. The top guys were not normal top guys. So if you knew that player X was going to become what Jalen Johnson become in three years, he would probably be number one for me. But that's not the way this, this question is actually coming in, I don't think. I, I just think Jalen is like, for instance, if you line this up, just to put this one more pin on this, if you lined up whoever you want, pick pick your guy, Risha Shea, Alex Sar, Reed Shepard, Steph Castle, Ron Holland. I think as of right now, I'd rather have Jalen for the next eight years than any of those guys. And obviously, Jalen's got three years of NBA experience, so it's not fair. But if you said, all right, start a team right now, no more context, who do you want between Jalen and those guys, I would choose Jalen. There you go. Anyway, um, I'm going to answer the question, though, the other way which is where they'd be taken as prospects. Again, not knowing anything, and crucial, again, one more time, not knowing anything about what happens after. Just on my pre-draft grade, that's how I'm going to answer this. I covered all these draft classes very closely, uh, both on Dime, where I write about the entire draft, not just the Hawks, and of course on this podcast. So it's a little bit easier to dig into my scouting reports that I had previously. The easier ones to answer are Kobe and AJ, because I think they would have gone basically in similar ranges to where they actually went. So, Obviously, they traded AJ, so this, this would be short. But I said many times during this last cycle that it was a pretty normal draft after the top five or so picks. I had Kobe and AJ rated slightly above where they actually ended up going. I had, um, you know, I had AJ as like a late lottery pick. Obviously, that's injury questions. Kobe, similar thing. Uh, I generally think Kobe and AJ would have been something like late lottery guys for me again in this class. They both went in that mid first round range. I would have maybe a few steps higher based on only pre-draft sample size. Nothing crazy. So pretty similar there. Jalen, again, is really hard because you're ignoring, again, what he's done in the NBA because we're going through, we're going back three years. But if you're listening to the podcast a long time ago when he was drafted, you would know that I loved that pick. I thought it was a great value for the Hawks at 20, at 20 overall. He fell too far. That was pretty obvious in the moment to me. Um, I had Jalen as a late lottery pick in that class, even after the way his freshman year went at Duke. I wish now that I was even higher on Jalen because <laughs> I think he would go even higher now. But there's only a very small handful of guys in that, in that class that I would like definitely say would go ahead of Jalen now in a redraft. But I would have said, again, probably the, in this year's class, I would probably have Jalen in, in like the mid lottery, something like a 6 to 10 range, 7 to 11 range. Again, pre-draft. Number one overall, if you knew. 7 to 11 if you didn't know. So it's a pretty, pretty big jump, but still a little bit higher than where I had in 2020, but not a lot higher based on uh, what we know at this point. Um, this last one is maybe the most controversial, I would imagine, because it's such a long time ago now. People will have forgotten this. And it gets harder and harder to remove post-draft samples as you go back, which for obvious reasons. You don't remember what the guys' prospect. They have more NBA tape, and that's on Yeka. 
So his rookie contract's now over. He's played four years in the NBA. So it's hard to do this. But uh, I'll just say this. I think pre-draft on Yeka would have been in the mix at number one overall in this class. Now, that might stun you if you're not covering the draft back then. But number one, he won number six overall in the draft. So it wasn't like that's a huge, crazy thing to go from six to one. That was a better draft than this one. And I actually had him fourth in that draft, pre-draft. Um, of course, I won't really get this now, but that was a best player available pick from the Hawks. They had just traded for Clint, but Clint hadn't played yet. But they basically just said, Onyeka is our best player on the board. We're taking him, which can happen. That's fine. Um, going back to my, my, I would say this. Onyeka has been fine as a draft pick so far. Um, I would have projected him at the draft to be better than he's been so far. That's also fair to say. Not a massive bust or anything like that, but I would have thought he'd be better at this point than he's been to this point. But many guests on the show have said this too. Like they're typically three to five players in most drafts better than everyone in this last draft, for instance, in 2024. Personally, I had Okongu at four in that class. I had him going ahead of guys that went ahead of him, like James Wiseman and Patrick Williams, who went ahead of him. I had Okongu going ahead of those guys, personally, for me. At least those two, if not more. Okoro, same thing. Um, this isn't to say that Okongu would definitely be number one in this draft, because he wouldn't be. I think he would have been in a similar tier to someone like Sar, to someone like Risa Shea, to someone like Shepard, to someone like Castle. Like he would have been somewhere in that mix. And it's kind of funny. I, somebody, I don't really check Reddit a lot. Somebody sent me a, a Reddit thing that was like laughing at Alex Sar not playing well in summer league because I was going to be mad about it. And I was like, what? Because I guess people mistakenly thought, I don't even know. Uh, Cause I had Sar number one on my board. But I went through great pains to say on the show a hundred times that it was not in his own tier. It was a narrow thing, and I was totally fine in the host not taking him. Like it didn't bother me at all. And that's kind of where I would be where I would have been on the Kongwu. I think he would have been in that tier, in that top tier, not by himself. But if you took prospect to Kongwu and put him in this draft, he would have been up there near the top. That's kind of what I would say. So no lower than two or three, four in this class for sure for me. Uh certainly not lower. I think he was a better prospect than Alex R, honestly. If I had to like say all things equal and look, I will admit it's, it's even hard for me to remember four years back, but I'm looking at like my notes from back then. Um, I don't like do a number grade on guys, but I think the Congo was a better prospect. The one thing he didn't have was the measurables that SAR had um, or like the, maybe like the upside case of someone like Reed Shepard, if he just bombs away. But like, I really think he was a better, he was a better player at that point for sure. Um, just not quite the same measurables that SAR has, but anyway, I'll leave it there for now. Hopefully that answers the question. And uh, it's hard you know, four years later, three years later, two years later. But I, I do think that all four of those guys would have gone a little bit higher, if not a lot higher uh, for in, in this last class. And we'll obviously really get that, that draft forever because we have the number, number one overall pick. You uh, talk about it a lot. And that's where Risha Shea will be in the future. And we'll see. All right. That's all I have on today's podcast. Hopefully you enjoyed this one. I will be back, we'll be back with some guests hopefully next week. Please go ahead and subscribe to this podcast on Apple on Spotify, on Overcast. Also, if you're watching on YouTube, go ahead and like this episode. That's a huge thing to help us with the algorithm and all that stuff. Also, please subscribe to the podcast on YouTube as well. Tell your friends about the podcast as well. I definitely would appreciate all of that. I'm sure you got somebody in your life that might like the Hawks that doesn't know about the podcast. So just send a link to them to whatever podcast platform, Apple or YouTube or whatever. Um, also follow the show on Twitter slash X at Lots on Hawks. Follow me there at BT Roland. You can also find the rest of my work in the Hawks slash Braves slash extra stuff space at patreon.com slash BT Roland. I appreciate you being here as always, everybody. Thanks for listening. Enjoy the rest of your weekend into the weekend. And I'll see you all next time.